Hi guys, bringing you a video today on this um, British Army shell dressing bag uh, in quite a ubiquitous bit of kit and certainly something sought, off, sought after by reenactors and collectors. Uh, this is a very nice clean example. Um, I don't have very many of these, I only have two. Uh, so what I can actually show you myself in the video is limited but I'll put some photographs in to show a bit of the evolution of these and a link in the description which I'll come to later on. The shell dressing bag was, was initially introduced, well its initial purpose was so that uh, stretcher bearers um, could uh, carry shell dressings and I believe this evolved, my understanding is this evolved from the initial use of regular uh, webbing or leather equipment haversacks during the Great War to carry shell dressings uh, and as a result of this a specific haversack was introduced, now not quite this design, it was a mix of canvas and leather I've put a photograph in the video here for you to have a look at an example from the IWM collection. And here we have an early example of a shell dressing bag from the Great War. Uh, you can see here manufactured in canvas and leather. So it makes sense, obviously, uh, troops were extemporizing, uh, were, were improvising with what they had, and then a purpose designed bag was introduced for carrying, well, have a sack for carrying shell dressings. Now, the mixed leather and canvas design seems to have been manufactured right the way through or it went back into production during the early years of the Second World War. Alongside this, there are 1939 dated examples of the, the full webbing type manufactured by Miko, which would make sense because obviously uh, Miko were a premier webbing manufacturer or web equipment manufacturer. So um, it's possible that due to damage to their factories and so forth, the canvas and leather examples went back into production as a stopgap. And then this example here, um, which I will just open up the flap now. It's not full, unfortunately. It only has six shell dressings in. There should be 12, uh, but I haven't managed to collect a full complement of shell dressings yet. Um, this example here is Miko, I think. Oh, it's a bit forgotten that, actually. No, it's not Miko, this one. I think the other one might be, uh, which we'll have a look at in a minute. But you can just see here uh, one... One, nine, four, two. I think it's a two. It might be a three. I don't know if you can see that, but the actual flap has been stitched over the maker's mark, which is quite amusing, uh, quite unusual as well. You don't often see that, um, but it is very otherwise very nicely marked up with the shell dressing across the, the shell dressing stamp across the front there and the big Geneva cross there. Um, as I say, originally intended just for carrying shell dressings, uh, not just manufactured in, in this form, but also manufactured early war in canvas and leather as the First World War examples were. Um, and you can see, I'll put a link in the description to, uh, I think it's War Relics, the forum. There's a, an interesting forum post on there showing a chap has a collection of all sorts of different uh, manufacturers, some in canvas and leather, some in, in webbing. But there are 1939 dated examples of these. So these are these were around early Second World War. Um, used for carrying shell dressings, as I say, by stretcher bearers. Post-war, um, these were used not only for that purpose, but began to be adapted for use as general purpose first aid kits. And they were used for a very long time. There are reports of chaps carrying up photographs of them being carried in the 1980s by certainly shipboard personnel. And apparently uh, even being used by the army into the early 90s, a lot with a lot of the old dressings and things sh uh, showing up for training and so forth. It's not surprising, really. They're good, solid bag and they, they you know they, they lasted a long time so certainly seen anecdotal evidence of them being used through into the 90s even um, but we'll bring an example up here which is one of the ones that was converted or simply restamped and you can see here that shell dressings has been blotted out and then we have general purpose uh, and it's a first aid kit basically um, uh, is what it what it would have been used for and there's various other markings and things it's had a name on the back at some point and some form of stain of something there i'm not sure now the contents of this aren't original um but i've attempted to get various contents together uh based on photographs of these i've seen which which did have the contents which seem to have varied uh greatly um i'm not entirely sure but there's all sorts of bandages and and uh lint and things in there got an iodine iodine uh, and pool and various things here and these were certainly around and being used in the 60s and here we have a section of footage from Jungle Green a BBC documentary on British troops in Borneo and you can see here during Hearts and Minds operation the general purpose first aid kit being used I highly recommend watching the documentary and I'll put a card in the video here for you to go and have a look if you're interested here for interest's sake you can see the contents of my general purpose first aid kit have a sack laid out I'm not entirely sure these are all completely accurate, but they are based upon photographs I've seen of these for sale and 
elsewhere in other people's collections. So there we have a brief overview of the British shell dressing bag. Uh, I hope you found that interesting, as I always say. Um, quite a, a you quite a ubiquitous sought after item. Uh, certainly, looking at prices they're going for these days, they're quite sought after. That seems to bear evidence to that. Um, but I hope you found that interesting. Uh, if you have and you like my content and you you haven't already, please consider subscribing. Um, and obviously, if you're already subscribed or newly subscribing, make sure you hit the notification button, the little bell, so you're all alerted when I upload future videos. Uh, in line with that, I have a Facebook page and an Instagram where I'll often put up previews of videos I'm going to be uploading. So if you'd be interested to see there as well, there's also photographs and things which I can't really slot into YouTube videos. Um, also, as I say, there's a link in the description if you're looking to purchase one of these. It's a, a, basically a post on uh, War Relics, uh, the War Relics forum, which shows a, a wide variety of different manufacturers and different styles, uh, different production methods. So that's sort of interesting to have a look at if you get uh, get a moment. And uh, until next time, bye for now.